I am Lisa Salka. I am the mayor of the town of Bluffton. And I am so sorry I can't be with you today, but so honored to be able to send you a video hello and welcome to the first of four conferences hosted by the South Carolina Commission for Minority Affairs. Also want to take a minute to, to give a quick shout out to a call to action who brought the focus to Bluffton and is very much a part of this conference today. So thank you. For those of you new to the area that haven't seen Bluffton, I hope you get a chance to take a ride around part of our 53 square miles and see what Bluffton is all about. We're a very inclusive town. We're a very diverse town. And what better place to start your conferences than in a town like Bluffton. You're sitting at my H.E. Uh, McCracken Middle School. That is one of three middle schools in our town. We have six elementary schools and two high schools, and we're busting at the seams. So you know we're a young town. Our average age is 36, and what you offer and what you bring to the table is everything Bluffton needs, and that is looking at minorities in business and bridging partnerships with the larger business community, and, and we embrace that. So on behalf of Town Council, I stand here welcoming you to what's going to be an exciting day, and I can't wait to get feedback from the end of the conference and look for many new partnerships to come. Have a great Bluffton day. Just like the mayor um, uh, tried to do, I'm going to also welcome you. Um, sorry for the technical difficulty we had, but the town of Bluffton and its council members, staff, really put in a little effort to try to help facilitate this program as well this week. So, uh, actually, it was a couple of months of planning. However, we want you all to know that uh, the South Carolina Minority Affair Association is really trying to make their presence known throughout the state. And, uh, and later on, I'll introduce you to a couple of people that is very instrumental in that. But at the present time, I'd like to introduce you to some people that are, are important for this program here today. First, I'd like to, to let you know that I am a, an advisory board member for Sonova's Bank, and the breakfast that you had this morning, coffee, donuts, and juice, was sponsored by Sonova's Bank. And the president of Sonova's Bank is here. Mr. Hank, Tom Hentz, would you please stand? Um, our chief of police has hit the ground running. Um, this is his first time being a chief, but he is really, really showing us some strong leadership. Today he provided, without question, security at no charge to this affair. And we want to thank him for that. Chief Chapman. <laughs> One of the other key members to our council uh, is here, Dan Wood, who is up for re-election. Dan, you want to say anything? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Dan Wood is here, and, um, and I want to thank him. He's uh, trying to make his presence known in a couple of places, so he had to leave us earlier today, but I want to thank him for being here today. Mark Orlando, our town manager. The town of Bluffton is one of the largest employer, employees, <coughs> employers <coughs> In Bluffton, we are not the largest, but we are one of the largest. And Mark um, is the chief executive officer for that position. So if you need a job before you leave here today, it'd be, it'd be good. To, this is a good time to say at home who you are. <laughs> okay, Mark Orlando, thanks for being here. I don't know how they plan to introduce some of our presenters and, our, and not only our presenters, but some of our sponsors as well as some of the people that are going to be displaying um, their, their uh, opportunities to things that they offer, small business. Um, but we have quite a few that's sitting over here to my right. And um, 
and I'm pretty sure they will be introduced or two I do that. Yes. Okay, very good. Now I'll get out the way, but I'll, before I do, I'd like to recognize in, um, two other people that are, are key. And um, Cynthia Haddad is a real champion, trust me. She, uh, she loved her work, she, and, um, and she has been dialing Nate, who is the head of Call to Action, probably every day to make sure that Nate stays on track. <laughs> And, uh, and then they dial her back and say, now are you on track? <laughs> so because of the two of them, uh, Bluffton is why um, they chose this site to be the first of many other um, sites that they want to uh, represent. And this is for this region, which is Colleton, Hampton, Beaufort, and Jasper. But they will be going throughout the state doing the same thing, okay? Now, I would like to introduce to you now Dr. Delores DeCosta, who is a native of, of Avondog, which we never heard of, right? South Carolina? <laughs> Avondog. <laughs> I, I have to tease her. Uh, she has 20 years of experience in federal policies and, and regulation and the Chief of Staff of the former Congressman Henry Brown, and the Regional Director of the U.S. Senator Tim Scott. <clears throat> Delores has a, a doctorate in strategic leadership in a, in a Regent University where she mastered the core competencies of strategic management and leadership. Her experience is in the federal policies making process, strategic planning, visioning, change and performance management, leadership training and development, organizational structure and design, human capital management and culture competency training. Very, very wide range of experience. Dolores is a 2016 recipient of the Women of Philanthropy and the Leadership <coughs> Award from the Coastal Carolina University in Conway, South Carolina. <clears throat> 2017 recipient of the Small Business Advocacy Award <clears throat> from the Minority Business Development Agency in Columbia, South Carolina. I take this time to introduce to everyone Dr. Delores DeCosta. Thank you so much, Fred. Good morning again. Good morning. I'm not as softly spoken as Fred is. I like for you to hear what I have to say. And I'm excited to be here this morning. I'm very new at the Commission for Minority Affairs. I spent 20 years in Washington, D.C., and I've been in this position since September of last year. When I joined the commission, I walked in, and I talked with the commissioners, and I said, you have a staff of 13 people to cover the state of South Carolina? Are you insane? <laughs> and I thought to myself, how am I going to transform this agency? into one that can be efficient and effective in the state of South Carolina. And I went back to my political days when making friends became a part of my agenda. So that's how we're going to build this organization, through our partnerships and friends that we make along the way. Before I get started, I want to piggyback on Fred's thank yous Mr. Tom Hentz from Sonovas Bank, one of his colleagues, Mr. Jawan Ayers, he is actually my newly appointed commissioner. He is the youngest commissioner on my board. He's 23 years old, and he is ready to roll. Right. He 
he wanted me to make sure that I tell everyone that when you think of Sonovas Bank, you think of welcome to the bank of here. So we want you to remember that. Welcome to the bank of here. And we want to thank Sonovas Bank. We call them at the very last minute. You know, being in a small agency, funds are very limited. And we have to rely on our friends to help us make ends meet. And we had all these other things covered. And when we thought about breakfast, we said, oh my goodness. We don't have breakfast, at least coffee. I called Juwan, I said, Juwan, I know there's Sonova's Bank in Bluffton area. Do you think Sonova's will provide us breakfast? He said, let me make a phone call. Five minutes later, we got you covered. That's what you call action. That's what you call making friends very fast and very soon. And we cannot thank them enough for what they've done for us this morning. And with regards to the town of Bluffton, again, small agency. We come to a town needing help. Not only did we have call to action working hard, but the mayor, the chief, and their staff, the crew, the team of the Bluffton, the town of Bluffton, came through for us in big ways. They have rolled up their sleeves and offered their services in many ways. The tables that we have here, the town of Bluffton. We are partners for, with Bluffton forever. We are hoping to make some great changes in this town as we, as we build our relationship to help this community as well as other communities around the state of South Carolina. With me today, I have a few of my staff members. I have Cynthia Haddad. Cynthia is the manager of our African American Affairs Division. We have our very new director of public information, Ms. Sharice Bell. We have Ms. Margaret Tillman. She's my procurement person. And I have Dr. Cody somewhere around here. He is my director of research and planning. I have a very young team of very active people who are helping me to transform this agency into one to help build bridges in the state of South Carolina. Oh, now he shows up. The chairman of my board just walked in. Mr. Kenneth Battle, can you stand and wave at everyone? Thank you so much for being here, Mr. Chairman. How many of you have ever heard of the Commission for Minority Affairs before this conference? A few of you. At the end of this conference, you will never forget us. Let me give you just some background about this commission. In 1993, when Carol Campbell was governor, they established the Commission for Minority Affairs to study the cause and effects of socioeconomic deprivation in African American populations. Our job was to go gather data, analyze that data, and produce documents for government use, the governor, elected officials, to come up with ways to make sure that adequate resources get into these communities. In 2003, they expanded that to include the Latino Hispanic communities, Asian communities, Native American communities. All of these divisions have a small business part to it. That's why small business is so important for us. We are looking at the economics of communities. And you, being small business owners, are the foundation of economics in our communities. The stronger you are, the stronger our communities will be. That is why we are here today. We want you to know that although we are a small agency, we partner with other agencies around the state of South Carolina to ensure that you are, uh, are provided the resources that you need 
to make you a strong business owner. The commission has 10 commissioners. Seven are aligned with the seven congressional districts. We have two at large and one appointee, governor's appointee. They serve for a period of about four years and they can be reappointed depending on the governor of the state. Today, we want you to know that there's something in South Carolina, there's some kind of resource in South Carolina to help you as a business owner. You will learn things that you've never heard of in South Carolina. Knowledge is what makes you strong. Relationships makes you strong. Small businesses can't survive without having some kind of relationship with other businesses, medium, large businesses, people who have been in business for a while. We need mentors to help small businesses to grow and become strong. When you're strong, our communities are strong. So therefore, it is important for us as an agency, even though we don't provide these services directly, you are getting ready to see some of the greatest partners in the state of South Carolina. They are going to offer you some knowledge about what they do and what they can do to help you as a business owner. We're going to begin with a topic some of you may have heard of. Have you heard of Opportunity Zones? How many of you have heard of Opportunity Zones? And a, a lot of people believe that Opportunity Zones will not help small businesses. But if you're a small business owner and you are ready, you will benefit from Opportunity Zones. If you are not ready, you will not benefit. You will not benefit. Small businesses in the state of South Carolina, about 20% fail the first year in business. And that number goes up. The more you know about business, the better you're going to be as a business owner. Always. Because you see, as a business owner, if you are not doing business the right way, you cannot expect a bank to loan you money. You cannot expect to have investment partners if you have not done your homework as a business owner. We are here today to help you meet the right kind of people who can get you to where, where you need to be. We're not trying to build you to compete against a medium or a large business. We want you to be, grow right where you are. And as you grow, you become, you move to the next level in business. But you have to do the homework. You have to put in the time. You have to make some sacrifices. We are here to help you find that kind of resource here in the state of South Carolina. You are going to hear some unbelievable stories about folks who have, who thought they'd never be in business, but they took a chance and took advantage of the, the benefits that this state provides. And now they are successful business owners. It can happen if you want it to happen. So please, listen, learn, and when we take our breaks, meet with the people who are bringing the information to you so that you too can grow your business. You can become a healthy business owner. When you are a healthy business owner, then you add value to the economy. The person who I'm going to introduce next He's a state representative. He represents District 113. Mr. Marvin Pendarvis. 
Marvin is a native of North Charleston. He's a product of public schools, Garrett Academy of Technology, and he understands the importance of education and opportunity in our community. Marvin is a graduate of the University of South Carolina Law School, and in 2017, he was elected as a state representative. He is going to come and tell you a little bit more about Opportunity Zones. Mr. Marvin Pendarvis. Good morning. Am I mic'd up to walk around? Good morning. Um, so my name is Marvin Pendarvis. Thank you for the introduction, Doctor. As the first presenter this morning, I want to be able to give you some information uh, that wakes us all up and that stimulates our mind and gets us to where we need to be. Uh, so just briefly about me, as she mentioned, I am from North Charleston. It's a privilege to be here in Bluffton. And I represent House District 113, which covers most of Charleston County, but it does go into Dorchester County as well. And I've been in the House of Representatives for about two years, going on my third term. And one of the reasons why I accepted the invitation to be before you all this morning is to talk about an issue that's near and dear to my heart, but also one that's so vital to our community. Uh, she mentioned earlier about business and about opportunities. And I truly believe that the catalyst for getting minority communities, distressed communities, where they need to be is us ensuring that they have the resources necessary in order to do so. And I've been following Opportunity Zones for some time. Uh, as many of you probably know, um, Opportunity Zones came about as a result of the 2017, uh, December 2017, a tax bill that came out of Congress and it was signed into law by the President. And part of that bill created a program, Opportunity Zones, that was geared toward investing in distressed communities. Now, South Carolina has about 135 designated opportunity zones. And across the entire state, the governor made the designations uh, based on tracks that were deemed, based on a, a, a predetermined formula to be distressed. Now, again, I told you I want to wake us all up, so I do have a couple of questions that I'm curious to know. Uh, one, and just she asked you this earlier, but I was sitting down and I couldn't see everyone. Who's heard of Opportunity Zones again? Just raise your hand if you've heard of it. Okay, so the majority of the room have not. So this presentation will extremely be helpful to you. And as far as the question that I wanted to ask you all, um, if you look at distressed communities, uh, their different characteristics. Uh, just anyone could, it could say and blurt out, uh, what would you say are the characteristics of a distressed community? Anyone? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> Poor infrastructure, that's exactly what I wrote down. All right, so we've got poor infrastructure. Anything else? Failing school. Failing school. Anything no else? Public transit. Excuse me? No public transit. No public transportation. Anything else? No grocery stores. No grocery stores. Food debt. Anything else? High crime. High crime. Anything else? No hospitals. No hospitals. Okay. So infrastructure, lack of transportation or any kind of real transit system, a food desert, high crime. We look at these poor education systems, and one that I'll throw in there that's pretty important, the lack of affordable housing. All of these things encompass distressed communities, and I like to think of it as um, a house, because all these components make up our house, and the foundation of that house is economic opportunity. Uh, we work on economics in minority communities. We address ensuring that everyone starts on a level playing field and has the opportunity and the access to opportunity uh, to be successful. Uh, then we change the community and in turn uh, we change the world. And so that's what Opportunity Zones does and it's been extremely impactful. Many people and the federal government is still in the process of coming up with the regulation as far as how it will be run. Uh, but I am hoping that by the end of this presentation this morning and you all will see the importance of what the federal legislation does, uh, but more importantly, what some of the things that we're working on in the General Assembly as far as a state component and how that can impact your business and 
how it can ensure that you play your role, not only in lifting up these communities, but also of, of, of lifting up your business. So again, where are the opportunity zones? As I mentioned before, uh, the goal of opportunity zones is to revitalize small communities, uh, such as rural areas, you know, Darlington, Denmark, Dillon, uh, places that have not seen much economic growth in years. Uh, entice business investors to work with local leaders. One of the things that I've been pushing as it relates to opportunity zones is a community benefits agreement, right? Many of us think of investors coming to these communities and it being a fast track to gentrification. Because we see it so much in some of these areas. And we see it not only for residential areas, but as you all would find important, a business displacement. That's a real thing, business displacement. When you have investors coming in and maybe big boxes popping up that are taking and, and, and forcing small businesses um, out of business. And so we've got to work on ensuring that when these investors come to these communities, they're talking with the people who live there, they're making sure that they listen to them, taking their ideas, and it's something that's mutually beneficial for the entire community. And I'll get back to that as we move along. And as we said before, when we looked at the characteristics of distressed communities, improving infrastructure and commodities that low-income communities need to ensure their success throughout the state. Now, the unique thing about opportunity zones, and again, essentially on a federal level, it provides um, an opportunity for investors to come in, uh, get capital gains benefits, and if they hold on to that property for a certain number of years, then they're able to benefit from that in the long run. And so on a federal level, it has a lot of benefits, and particularly if you're looking to get involved in working with different investors uh, to look at the communities that have opportunity zones and, and what projects may be beneficial. Uh, but the one of the problems is that's federal benefit. I've done some research and there are a number of states that have said, what can we do to accelerate the impact that Opportunity Zones have on our state? Because these investors coming in, they get the federal benefit, that's great, we want them to have that because it has the potential uh, to benefit business, to attract business, which many of you would be able to flock to these areas that are being revitalized, but also lift these communities up. But what can we do on a state level in the form of incentives and these packages to further entice businesses to come, to further entice these investors to give as much as they can and pour into these communities in a meaningful way. So I looked at Maryland, for example, and what Maryland has done has supercharged their opportunity zone. Their governor saw a need to ensure that they do everything in their power to make sure that these incentives benefit as many citizens as possible in addition to it. And I think if we're looking at trying to truly transform a distressed communities, then that is the way to go, to make sure that we're not just relying on the federal benefits, but we're doing everything that we can to supplement it with as many state incentives as we can. And so House Bill 3186 was introduced last year. It was a bipartisan bill, one that basically said, if you are investing in an already designated opportunity zone as designated by our governor, then you will have additional state incentives um, in addition to those federal gains that the investor has. And so that benefits many businesses because in my conversation, and when, before we introduced this legislation, we did listening sessions because it's important to hear from people in the business community, um, investors, uh, people who live in these communities to find out what is it that you need, uh, what is it that is going to help transform your community in a meaningful way. And what I found was many of these businesses are able to take advantage of some of these incentives if they come into these areas that have been historically distressed, uh, in addition to other incentives that they might have. 
Uh, that will help attract many, many small businesses. Uh, it's a very, it's a big boom for business, uh, particularly small businesses, because we want to be able to protect the fabric of many of these communities and not drive them out, but in ensuring that we uh, create and foster an environment that has been there for historically. Many of these communities have been there a long time. And so we've done the in community engagement and outreach, as I mentioned, trying to ensure that everything that's done has been mutually beneficial. So what the state legislation does is ensure that if an investor is going to go into a community that they're talking to the residents there, that they come up with some kind of agreement and, and that that agreement is something that benefits both parties. In addition to the state's incentive that could be added alongside federal incentive. So it's important to really look into not only how you can take advantage of the federal tax incentive, but in this bill passes, what it looks like for states and the importance of having this in South Carolina. As I mentioned, Maryland has um, taken it a step further. Their general assembly is looking how they can further use opportunity zones to benefit its citizens. And Maryland isn't the only state. Uh, there are a number of states across the country that have seen this as a potential boom for their citizens and are looking at what can we do with currently established law or introducing new legislation that need be uh, to make sure we're taking full advantage of this. Uh, we get a real great opportunity, pun intended, uh, to truly transform a lot of these communities in our state. And in order for us to do that, uh, we've got to be thoughtful, uh, we've got to be mindful, uh, we've got to be aggressive, and, and we've got to work together, uh, both community members, investors, business community. And I'm particularly excited about the business components of it. And, and I thought long and hard about it as I was getting prepared for this conference because I've had a number of conversations with Mr. Ballard and I. We, we've talked quite a bit, um, not only last session and this session, just about the importance of the commission and the work that it's doing, but also for the businesses that thrive and, and, and really look to it uh, for information and for resources and tools uh, to truly enhance what they're doing. And if you all look at the Opportunity Zones, and I truly believe you'll find a tool, particularly if we're able to take it a step further like we need to, and that'll be able to help you in the long run. As I said, that's the, this is a little bit going on with the Maryland bill. They were able to pass that, that actually passed their General Assembly this year. This is the South Carolina Opportunity Act. Now, I mentioned House Bill 3186, which was introduced last year. But there's current legislation, well, there's legislation being drafted, I'll say, that aims to do what House Bill 3186 did when I described earlier, but also does more. And what I learned from the conversations that I had with many of my colleagues in Columbia about the, that bill and what Maryland did and things that have taken place since is we really, really can take this thing and, and really do some good. And it came to me as a result of, uh, if are many of you familiar with the deal that uh, the Panthers Tax Incentive deal, they want to raise their hands on in York County and so what we did was we passed a bill to have the Panthers relocate their headquarters uh, to South Carolina. And there were a number of tax incentives that went along with that. And so it got me thinking about House Bill 3186, again, thinking about small businesses and the opportunities that lie for them. And I had a conversation with the governor. I had my staff. We got together. We had a 15 meeting with the governor uh, right before we got out of session. And the government and myself, we prepared a presentation, a lot of information in this slide was in that presentation. And we talked about how South Carolina has an opportunity uh, to get this right, uh, and get it right at the outset. And I said, if, if we want to say South Carolina is winning, uh, let's really take it that step further and, and demonstrate what winning really looks like. And so what we were able to come up with was a comprehensive package that does all the things that I described before, but also creates what will benefit you all, a database. 
So what Maryland has done, which is pretty unique, is they've got a database where business folks like yourself are able to go online, take a look at the different opportunities in the areas, take a look at areas that you may want to invest in. And it's all there. Now, granted, that takes time and it takes resources to get there. But think about what that could do for you. Because we've got all this information, but one, it's housing it in a, in a, in a place that people can see it in, in a functional way and ease of access to get to the information and putting it in a format that people understand. We want to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to help our citizens because this is out there for you all. It's the benefit it transforms these communities and businesses are going to be part of that because businesses want to go to areas where they can thrive, right? That's the part of being business. I mean, obviously you want to uh, provide some kind of public asset and, and public good, but at the end of the day, uh, it's about the bottom line and what you're able uh, to bring back home. And going into areas that are thriving, that are on the horizon uh, for growth is going to be particularly good. And having this in one, in one housing database as what I'm proposing is, is really going to be good. And so Maryland was able to do that. I think it's, it's something that's necessary for South Carolina. I'm pleased to report to you all that uh, the government is very open to it, uh, so much so that we had a follow-up meeting in July to discuss the bill and its impact and what it will be able to do. And so I'm, I'm very optimistic about it. I mentioned that to you all because we have uh, so much uh, as a state that we can be doing uh, to help our businesses grow, to help our minority communities grow and thrive. And as I mentioned before, the foundation of this home is an economic opportunity. We all hear the saying, a rising tide lifts all boats. But that's the, you know, rising tide does lift all boats. We gotta make sure that we have recurring tides and more and more boats to lift so that we're all lifted up and all on a playing field we can be successful and reap the benefits that are all out there for us to get. So I'm excited about this. Um, as I said, this is just kind of summing up what I mentioned as far as the tax breaks. Uh, this gets into the nuances. I'll certainly be glad I only have uh, probably about five minutes left. Uh, but I, I want to make sure you all get this information. This breaks it down as far as the tiers. Uh, many of you probably know, and I, I know they mentioned the county managers here and someone from town council who probably know about the nuances as far as tier one county, tier two, tier three, tier four counties based on um, whether you're distressed based on the, the, the population and also based on any poverty levels that may be there. So the most distressed counties obviously are the ones that we want to make sure are being attracted the most invested to. And this just gets into the nuances of what that looks like and what it can do. And so I'll be more than glad to make sure the staff, a doctor, and Ms. Adai to get everything out to you all and then certainly my information so that you can ask me any questions that you need to. Again, tax breaks that are investments to our community. Um, we have a great, great opportunity with 135, 135 designated opportunity zones in our state. And I don't want us to miss the boat. I've seen it in Charleston, the benefits early on that this can have. A lot of my district is in an opportunity zone. That's why I'm so passionate. So much of my district. You talk about food deserts, we have them. You talk about poor education and poor schools, we have them. You talk about high crime, we have them. You talk about the lack of affordable housing, it exists in my district. I say that because I'm seeing, I'm seeing early signs of the tide turning in a positive direction. And it's because you got you start to see it and you see the businesses come, they pop up. You want to support them. You see the investment coming in and the investors who are working with the community. The Post and Curry did a, a nice write up about um, an investor and, and a company that came in and, and wanted to do some things on a particular road that was going to be a detriment to the members of that community. The community that had been there uh, longer than the city of North Charleston existed. And there was some pushback by members of the community, rightfully so. But I'm telling you that because what was able to happen is uh, they got together and they came up with an agreement that was mutually beneficial. 
The investors were happy. The businesses that came here were happy. The residents were happy. And it was something that while everyone didn't get exactly what they want precisely, everyone got something that they were comfortable with. And that's the art of negotiation. That's what we want, uh, to be able to provide a path to success uh, for all people who were involved. Again, a chance for small businesses to make an impact on their community. The Department of Commerce in South Carolina will be heavily involved. I want to make sure I give you all the information that you need. We need to be a voice for the voices. We need to give hope for the hopeless. And opportunities will present a path for us to do all of that. Uh, but in order for us to get to that point, uh, we've got to make sure that we stand in the gaps. Uh, we support uh, initiatives in our communities that are going to help businesses, minority communities, minority businesses, small businesses uh, thrive. And that's what I'm here for. I believe that's what you all are here for. And Opportunity Zones provide a path for us to do this. Um, this was only a sum of what this is. This is, a, this is a large piece of legislation. There's so much to discuss with it. I've been beating this drum for the last year. Um, but I solicit uh, your thoughts. I solicit your questions and, and follow up once we get to a point of where this is online and, and active. And I'm optimistic that we will get there. I think you all will be glad of that. It exists, uh, but more importantly, you'll be taking advantage of it and you'll start to reap the benefits. And most importantly, um, our community will start to thrive because of it. I uh, thank you all for your time. Do we have any questions for Mr. Pendarvis? Yes. Am um, I still on? Yes, and what's your name now? Bridget Frazier. Ms. Frazier, thank you for the question. Uh, that is true, and I've looked at the maps, and certainly they're not as, as you try to make it in a digestible format as possible, but sometimes even that can be difficult for the layperson to really go through and look on. Um, I do know that if you call the Department of Commerce, now what's online is online, and I would imagine there's a lot that goes into trying to make sure it's as user-friendly as possible. But if you really want to know about the areas of Beaufort County, let's talk, talk to the Department of Commerce. They'll be more than glad to give you that information. I, I can put you in contact with who you need to uh, in order to get that information. Because it, it's out there, and I'll be honest with you, the first time that I looked at it, Ms. Frazier, and you know, I didn't really understand it. And it took me some time to really understand exactly how to play with it. You, know, you, you have to play with it for a while to really understand it. But uh, it can take, take, some, take some time. So. It is a valid concern, but the information is out there, and I want to make sure you have access to it. Thank you. My pleasure. Yes, sir. A lot of my colleagues have trouble differentiating opportunity zone from hub zone. Can you tell me what the difference is? Yes, sir. What's your name? Uh, Davis. Mr. Davis. Oh, yeah. Mr. Davis, um, so you hear that a lot. Um, one of the things that I heard earlier on with opportunity zones from Davis is You've got opportunity zones. Anyone heard of new market tax credits? Uh, you have enterprise zones and hub zones. You've got all these zones that have been created over the course of the last 20, 30 years, all for good purpose. The sole difference, and I'll just break it as plainly because there's a lot of nuanced differences, but the biggest difference that I can say is that this is, the opportunity zones is probably the only one, the only one that's investor driven. And you've got a federal benefit. Most of them, <clears throat> the others um, have some other driving factor. The opportunity zones are particularly federally driven by the investors, and those are the ones that come out. And so it's a unique way that they did it. A lot of the language from new market tax credits did go into the opportunity zones, the hub zone stuff. It's similar in the concept that they want to you know, help revitalize communities. But the way they do it and how it's driven is different. So that's the simple way to put it. And we can talk offline about all of the, the nuance. Anyone else? Yes. Mr. Moutry. 
I don't know. Oh, I good to see you. The young lady asked in reference to who to contact and you indicated the Department of Commerce. Shouldn't there be someone on the local level that can be an advocate, a voice with that information for the opportunity zone that all of these citizen business owners shouldn't be calling Columbia, but either the city council or some of these representatives that are in here? In my bill passes, there will be. <laughs> that, that's, precisely, that's precisely why I introduced the legislation, because, again, let's, let's be very honest. This, this whole idea isn't even three years old yet. You know, it's, it's very, it's, it's in its infancy. And we're still, the federal government, they're still passing down regulation. The Department of Treasury, they're still trying to give directives on what this is and how it works, which is why you see so many states take action. But for you and, and, and I and folks who want to see this program grow, we're going to need to have the information where people can go on the state thing, which is what Maryland did. They have the state database, but they've also got different in every county and different areas. They've got someone who you can contact and be able to do that. If that goes to county council or, or, or the different municipalities, it depends. I agree with you, we should be there. We're not there, unfortunately, and so all of it is coming just from one source currently. However, over time, um, and as this program gets more and more attractive and we see the traction that it gets, I believe we'll, we'll have to, to come to grips with that. We're going to need to, to differentiate it out and, and make sure that we, we have people in different areas of the state that can address the concern. Thank you for the question, Steve. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, is, is uh, all this information about the opportunity zone, is it also working in conjunction with the Southern Carolina Alliance? Or is that... Tell me a little bit more about the alliance. Uh, the Southern Carolina Alliance is a group that... Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know who's heading it, but they're working to get more businesses into the construction rates. Okay, so... Is it like a nonprofit group? Or? Okay. There are a number of nonprofits that are involved in it. So the simple answer to your question is likely yes. They're they may not be working per se with them hand in hand, but what that comes out of Opportunity Zone is going to inevitably benefit any nonprofit that want to get into this work because you know, from a specific example in Charleston. The nonprofits that I've had conversations with and that are interested in addressing the issues in distressed communities have been those who wanted to work in affordable housing. And so you get nonprofits that come up and they're wanting to look at the advantages of investing in these areas, areas earlier to address the affordable housing crisis. I would imagine this alliance, whatever their specific mission is, and if it's just to increase awareness, then they're going to inevitably do that. So there are a number of groups that are that have seen the legislation that believe it's important, that want to support it, and they're following it every step of the way. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. So it's a it, it's a natural tie-in, um, and I'm familiar, I'm loosely familiar with the community reinvestment act. And it's similar to what the answer that I gave to Mr. Uh, to Mr. Davis. Um, opportunity zones is kind of in its own lane as far as the kind of benefits that it gives and what drives it to get those benefits. Uh, a lot of it is reinvested because money that comes into that community can be reinvested once the investor realizes their capital gains over a course of time. But I don't want to get into all the nuances because that can get technical and all the tax codes. Suffice it to say, uh, it does tie in. Um, and but remember that the state differences as to what drive it. Does that answer your question? Loosely. In fact, we can talk offline. I, I'll be more than glad to answer anything directly. Before I go, because I, I, I want to make sure I leave room for the other presenters. Um, if anyone has a pen and paper, I didn't put it for my slide, but I want to give you all my information to reach me so you'll know how to contact me. And my telephone number, it, and you did reach me in my office, is area code 843-225-2520. That's 
225-2520. And then my email address is info, I-N-F-O, at marvinpendarvis.com. And Marvin is M-A-R-V-I-N, like Star with Marvin. And Pendarvis is P-E-N-D-A-R-V-I-S. So I will conclude my remarks there, but you all have been asking great questions. You've been a good audience. And I'm just thankful for the opportunity to be able to present this to you. Let's give Mr. Pendaris another hand, please. Before we move to our next presenter, uh, I forgot one very important thing. On the back of your name tags, you will see two tickets. If you will fill out the one with your name and phone number, when you go to lunch, we will have a box for you to drop it into. We will be giving away a new business Dell laptop. You have to be present to win. So, so please remember to fill out the ticket with your name and, and uh, phone number, and when you pick up lunch, drop it into the box, and the drawing will be held at the end of the conference. Well, we have to keep you here. How many people are business owners, actual business owners? Okay. Sir, right here. Why are you in business? Why did you go into business for yourself? Uh, just following after my dad. Following your dad. Anybody else? Tell me why you went into business. Yes, ma'am. More income. More income. Very good. Anybody else can tell me what made you decide to go into business? Being your own boss. Being your own boss. Excellent. Anybody else? Very good. One more. Creating a legacy. Well, did anyone go into business just to make money? That would be my first answer. I want to go into business for myself because I want to make money. Bottom line. So therefore, I want to do everything that I can to make sure that my business is prosperous. With that being said, our next presenter is Ms. Pam Green. I'm sorry, I know we have a break schedule there, but I think, if you don't mind, we're gonna just keep going and then stop for lunch. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. Very good. Pam Green is director of the South Carolina Office of Small and Minority Business Contracting and Certification. In this role, she connects small, minority, and women-owned businesses with state contracting and procurement opportunities via the state's certification program, training, individual consultation, and business forums. She works with over 100 state agencies to implement and monitor contracting activities with minority businesses in accordance with the applicable policies, laws, and regulations. Ms. Green also spent over 25 years in financial services as vice president of the arena of business development, sales performance, team development, and training. She is a native of Anderson, South Carolina, a graduate of the, United, the University of South Carolina, and the proud parent of two sons. She's an avid believer in paying it forward and believes her calling is to bring knowledge and awareness to others to help empower them to advance their cause, to create and build healthy and prosperous environments in our communities. May I present to you, Ms. Pam Green. Good morning. Good morning. How are we feeling? Good. 
Anytime I get up, and especially on a Saturday morning, for people to come and spend your time like this on Saturday, says you're serious. Says you're serious about getting information, gaining knowledge. I have a saying, and my son is outside in the car working on some stuff for school, but it is always important to be in the room. But it's also more important to make sure that you have a seat at the table. So the information that you're gaining today needs to be taken obviously seriously, which I know it is because you guys are spending your Saturday here. But I say to my kids all the time, if you're not seated at the table, if you're not at the table, then that means you're on the menu. So it's very important as we take a look at our communities and making sure that we have representation at the table. We talked about the voice for the voiceless, you know, hope for the hopeless, as um, Representative Pindar was talking about. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our office. Um, I bring you greetings from the Office of Small and Minority Business Contracting and Certification. And because that's such a mouthful, we just say SMBCC. Now, Dolores talked about how their agency is small with, you know, 13 people, right? So I said, we must be non-existent because, really? My office is really only two people for the whole state of South Carolina, and I've been able to kind of, with a low profile, work in a temporary person that I hope to bring on permanently to get us to three. Um, but our office, our focus deals with certification and contract, and we'll talk a little bit about that. How many folks are familiar with the certification process for small business? Okay. This is you in the room? All right, great. So this will be very interesting. <laughs> now, I might be a little tag. I just use the arrows, correct? It's not me. and goal because that's just a part of what we have to do. We are obviously a state agency. We actually fall under the Department of Administration, which is a cabinet agency, too, um, that falls under the governor's office. Um, and basically what we're looking to do is obviously promote the interests of small minority and women-owned businesses, but more importantly is to try to advocate for equitable portions um, as it relates to some of the state contracting and helping folks to learn how to leverage um, certification through our office. So our office, why are we here? Basically we were legislated under Article 21 back in 1981, which basically says or defines what's considered to be a minority business. And it took, took into consideration that that business has to be considered, that owner has to be considered socially and economically disadvantaged. So you ask yourself, what does that mean? Socially disadvantaged. It just means that you fall into the criteria of either being a minority or being a female-owned business. So as long as you fit that criteria, then you satisfy the social piece. Then the economics of it deals with, you know, how are you looking from a uh, financial standpoint as a business owner, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. I do have to just basically say there are no loans, grants, or guarantees of contracts coming out of office. We're more or less those that monitor the contracts and then we try to advocate for our folks and make sure that the folks that we're certified and have a chance to have some at-bats. Um, one of the things we have to be mindful of is that we do not certify nonprofits. You must be a for-profit business and you must have an office in the state of South Carolina. So when we talk about certification, all we're saying is, is that we are certifying that this business is minority-owned and it fits the criteria. We ask the question, what is that criteria? Number one, as I stated, is you have to have an office in the state of South Carolina. You must have been in business for at least a year. And as the owner, if you're a minority owner, 
whether you're um, a female, African American male, whether you're Native American, you have to own 51% of that business. And when we talk about the 51%, one of the things we're making sure in our office is that you're truly a bona fide owner of that business, that you truly manage that business, that you truly make the decisions, and that no one is actually trying to use, so let's just say, a female as a front person, let's just say, for a construction company. And that person is, that female is in there, and what does she do? She's just paying bills. But she knows absolutely nothing about the construction piece. So we have a site visit, we go out, we talk to that owner, we ask questions. We want to make sure that you're truly 51% a bona fide owner of that business. The economics of this as a minority owner is making sure that your personal net worth falls under 1.32 million. Who fits that criteria? <laughs> I stand before you, I fit that criteria. So those are basically the four uh, main criteria that we look for. And if for some reason we're not able to certify you, depending upon the reason, you may be able to reapply within a year. So I talked about the fact that we have a contracting piece that's attached to us. So we work with about, it's actually about 130 or so state agencies. So knowledge. Every year, every fiscal year, I think the end of, by the end of July, the agencies that we work with basically say, hey, we have this budget, of this budget, here are the dollars that are controllable, and here's what we're saying we plan to spend with certified minority businesses. And they send this report to us every year. We take this information, put it into a database, and then every quarter, they send us progress reports to let us know how they're tracking towards those goals. Y'all didn't know that, did you? For the state of South Carolina. So, to give you just uh, how you kind of frame this out, let's just say the last couple of years, we've spent somewhere in the neighborhood of about $40 million with certified minority businesses. But the caveat is, do you have any idea how much the agencies have committed to spending with minority businesses? A whole lot more. Okay? It's got a B on it. Okay? So the question then becomes with our office of now three people is if we take a look at the $40 million that's being spent and what they've actually committed, that says we'll leave the money on the table, correct? I say to anybody, the best way to keep stuff from people, put it in writing. Okay. We have to read, we have to stay abreast of things. You know, there's stuff out on our website that clearly says, hey, they get these reports every year to know kind of what they're going to spend. So, just in the last two weeks, I've met with the procurement folks, and we are trying to drill down better with why we have such a gap. So sometimes some of the things that comes up is we can't find qualified people. I don't believe that. Okay? There are opportunities. The, the press isn't in here, are they? No. <laughs> Let me be careful with what I say. I want to keep my job. But I can turn off the recorder. <laughs> <laughs> but we're working in conjunction with, with procurement, and it's part of the regs that are there that governs our office, you know, to figure out ways of how do we do more business with our small minority businesses and women owned businesses. And what's happening that we're leaving so much money on the table. So we've actually formed a task force. Um, we've met the last two times and we've got some things that we're going to be working for the state to bring knowledge and to try to close that gap some. And then we're going to identify the areas that they say they can't find folks. And then what are we going to do for our office and the people that we partner with? We're going to find those industries that they're saying that they're needing to make sure that they're certified in their office. So, 
The other thing is, is once you're certified from, with our office, that may make you very attractive to some of your larger companies, some of your prime folks, you know, to do business with you. It's like, hey, you know, you can sub out to, to my company. You have the benefit of getting a tax credit of about 4%, which that owner or corporation or company, a large company, is able to take advantage of that up to nine years. That makes you attractive when you get the certification. And that's just the form that they use. We have nothing to do with that. That's actually through the Department of Revenue. So when you think about certification, the question becomes, okay, so I come to your office, Pam, I get certified, you know, then what? Or we've had folks that get certified and then they say, okay, I ain't got the contract. You know, like the bills are supposed to start sounding and, you know, all this money going to come rolling in. No. You still market yourself. You still brand yourself. You still make it a point to, and I tell folks, you go out on our website, we have a link to the procurement site. And out there is a list of all the agencies, the contact people, the actual procurement managers or the buyers for that particular agency, their telephone numbers and their emails. I'm a believer in being pleasantly persistent, which means you can nag somebody to death, but very pleasantly. But it is still to market yourself once you are certified to say, hey, I've identified this particular agency as a potential client for me. I want to get 10, 15 minutes of your time just to talk about what I could potentially do for your agency. Or I would like an opportunity to send you my capability statements. How many of us are familiar with capability statements? Okay. Which is basically a resume for your business. So you continue to market. And let's just say you've been contacting an, an agency, you've emailed them, you've called them, no one's responding, call me. And then I will actually try to link you up with that particular person because we are still advocating for you. Okay. So let's, we have an actual, um, I don't think we went into this yet, but we have an agreement with the um, Department of Transportation, which basically says that if you do certification through the Department of Transportation and get what is called a DBE, cover some acronyms. A DBE is a Disadvantaged Business Enterprise. It's certification through that department. You go through them, you get certified, and as long as you've been in business a year, they'll send me a summary and then you're certified automatically through my office as an MBE, which is a Minority Business Enterprise, or a WBE, which is a Woman-Owned Business Enterprise for certification. So where do we get the information to get certified? If you go out to our website, which is smbcc.sc.gov, and you click on applications, and then you'll see to your far to your right, applications and certification forms. Right there is where you download the information that's required through our office, which is an application and checklist. And this is just a one pager of your certifying through DOT that would need to be completed. So what does the process look like? As I stated, go to smbcc.sc.gov, download the information that's there, and then what do you need? So everybody, when they see the checklist, I think there's, I don't know, 14, 16, 17 items, and they're like, okay, you want our first form. You want everything that we have. Yeah. And I say this, don't let it scare you. I mean, it, the, 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 the biggest things are just getting your financials together. If you have your financials together right there, then it's a pretty uh, simple process to get our stuff together. So the main components of what we need to be certified, as long as you've been in business for at least a year, is going to be three years of tax returns. That's both personal and business. And then you will have to complete a personal financial statement. And the personal financial statement is what we're looking at to make sure you're, you're below that $1.32 million. The other piece that's real, real crucial, and there's, there's a lot of things in here, guys, when you look at the checklist, but there will be some things that it just doesn't apply to you. So I had a, a, a person the other day, and he's like, you know, Pam, you're asking for an organizational chart. It's just me. I said, well, you're the organization. That's it. So, there will be things on here that, that, that don't apply, you just mark that it doesn't apply, and why, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move through that. 
There's some information that we're requiring us just making sure as a business you actually have an account with the bank. And we'll require some information there. But number 16 is very crucial. Any business that wants to do business in the state of South Carolina must have a South Carolina vendor number. That is the only way that you can do business in the state of South Carolina or bid on any of the projects that are in South Carolina. So that's a part of our registration piece that that must be completed and included. Once we've received your information, our staff reviews it, and as long as you satisfy the paper piece, then we're going to move into the site visit. We'll give you a call, say you want to come out to your business, whether it's a brick and mortar, whether it's in your kitchen, whether it's in your living room, wherever that you designate as a business, we come out, talk to you about the business to make sure that you are actually a viable business. Once everything has been reviewed and we see that you're meeting criteria all the way around, then you're certified. You'll receive a letter, which has our governor's name attached to it, and you will receive a certificate that says that you are certified as a minority business along with a number. And then you have that certification for five years. Why is it important, you know, as far as getting that uh, certification number? Because sometimes when you're bidding on things for state contracts, it's going to ask you, are you certified? And it will ask for the number. We have up to 60 days to do the process, but with our little team of three, we try to turn everything around in two to three weeks and get out to you for the whole state. So some of the benefits are, um, you know, there's a networking piece, because you're going into a database with all other certified minority businesses. As we talk about, you know, economic empowerment and, and, and growth, we have to do business with each other. So when I talk to you, I talk to you from a standpoint of having been a business owner. Um, my ex-husband and I owned a business, a couple businesses together, which is probably why we're exes. We get along with right now. But <laughs> you eat what you kill. So when I'm talking to folks, we do one-on-one -on -one consultations. Um, try to help guide folks in kind of this whole entrepreneurship one-on-one -on -one where needed for some of new new businesses or those that may have an idea we can direct you in different paths. We partner on the uh, city level, county level, federal level. So all of us partner together so that we all understand each other's programs. So usually when you come to the office, I'm not just going to talk strictly about the state certification, but I'll make sure that you get connected with SBA as it relates to some of the federal certification and self-certification and why. Those are just things that we um, try to do. I say that you're a part of a database. That database is used by other companies outside of the state that may be looking for something that's used by prime contractors when they're looking to bring on subs with different scopes. They use that. A lot of times they'll contact us and say, hey, we've, um, we've won this particular uh, bid and we're looking for folks that hit this scope, this, that fit this scope. And so then we basically provide a list, and usually we'll send that out to those folks to say, hey, this is an opportunity for you. Solicitations, whenever you're certified through us, they've just changed some of the procurement um, thresholds and things of that nature. So it is possible that you can receive directly emails from agencies that say, hey, we've got this project, this type of thing going on, we would like a quote, proposal, a thing of that nature for you, for you to send in, you can receive emails. That's what the solicitation piece means because those agencies use those also. Especially when we're looking at, say, thresholds under 10,000 and they're needing something done, they can reach out directly to that small business owner. And we encourage that because that is a question of whether or not they've actually tried to solicit to certify minority businesses for this particular project. Then every year we put on an annual trade show to get you all in the room with all of the representatives from state procurement. It's an opportunity for you to brand, you know, brand your booth however you like, but it's an opportunity for you to engage with procurement, to attend sessions. <clears throat> we just had it in May, and 2020s will be April 23rd, and I'll make sure I'll get a list of everybody that's here so that we'll put them on the list to be able to attend. Um, the actual session and we usually have anywhere from 350 to 400 people there and the other great thing is that you talk about you know each other's business you do business there 
I always like to share one of the success stories. It's a young lady that was out of Charleston. She called me the night before the trade show, and she said, you know, look, should I be there? Should I come? I have a barbecue sauce. And I'm like, you know, the state pretty much procures everything. I mean, we do lunch. We eat. We have a treat. We do all kinds of things. We would like some barbecue. And she decided to come. She ended up linking up with one of the procurement folks from USC. She did it a small event for them which morphed into a large event that she did for them at the beginning of the year, which morphed into something for her on the federal side, and then it was kind of a snowball effect of just kind of building a relationship. It doesn't guarantee a contract. It's still always about relationships, but it's also about knowledge and how do I leverage this. Her barbecue sauce is on the shelves of Food Lion, so she ain't doing that. Okay. Um, quarterly newsletters under construction, and this is something we're working through to be able to start highlighting new businesses as they come on with all of our state folks. Um, we do regional workshops and seminars across the state of South Carolina. We partner with a lot of folks um, to put on these seminars and workshops. I'm here on my Saturday with y'all. Um, I did go to Savannah last night with me and with my son. We did dinner food, so we had a good time last night. Um, we promote, obviously, promotion with subcontractors for prime. That's another benefit of the certification. So, doing business with the state of South Carolina. There are some online resources. And one of them, when I talk about going to the procurement site, which is procurement.se.gov, if you will go to that center box that's labeled for vendors and contractors, that tells you how to do business with the state of South Carolina. And it gives you some of the guidelines of how they procure and do certain things for the state. So that's kind of a, a bigger snapshot of that. Um, it also allows you to go out and take a look at some of the opportunities that are there. So anything over $25,000 is out there advertised um, on SCBO, S-C-B-O dot So if you are offering, say, IT, services. You can sort for that and see what opportunities are out there and what they're looking for as a potential way of bidding. I'll tell you, do not bid on anything that you do not have the capacity to fulfill. Prime example, had a gentleman, great guy, great at what he does, won a $5 million contract was to start like, I don't know, four or six weeks, four to six weeks later, and didn't have the people to fulfill the contract. Okay? There is no real backtracking, you know, <laughs> at that point. And so what I say, what I say to folks is, and he had to, you know, had to learn, you know, we make mistakes, we have to learn, but then it puts a bad taste in the mouth. Okay, of not having what they feel to be qualified folks. So I just say to you, if you see something now, you're like, oh yeah, I can do that. Just make sure you have the capacity to be able to do it. Because I think it was a little shock when he won the contract. He won the contract because he went so to know. Okay. <laughs> and then it was like, okay, let me okay, let me try to get my people, let me try to do this, let me try to do this. You know? So I it, it's real and it can happen, just be ready. So we do try to um, provide through some of our workshops and seminars how to get prepared and have procurement to come in and talk to you about that process and what it really looks like. Um, this is just an example of when you go out there to look at some of the opportunities. It's just a snapshot and it's not very, very clear. I'm sorry. What questions do you all have? We good? So I will be available if you have questions about certification. Um, I'll have my cards with me. Feel free to call our office and we're more than happy to answer any questions and help you however we can. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Are you going to be able to send a presentation to Dr. DeCosta's office so you can send it there and yeah, I think I can actually send that. Yes, yeah, I can send And let me just add something before I forget. I'm sorry. Whenever at the end of every year, as a matter of fact, we're preparing it now, 
we do send the report to the governor of kind of what's been spent across the state to show what's being spent with minority businesses and then kind of what the um, what the goal was. So that's just something to keep in mind. Thank you. Be ready. Be ready. There is a lot of money to be made in the state of South Carolina. But you must be ready. We're missing out on opportunities because we're not putting in the time to get ready. Our next presenter, he did just that. His name is Calvin Whitfield. He's a CEO and founder of CCS International LLC. Calvin is a native of Detroit, Michigan, where he grew up with his six sisters and four brothers who still live there. But he decided he wanted to stay in God's country. So he now stays in the Charleston area. Calvin has over 36 years in the construction industry with a combination of field work and management. He spent 22 of those years with Morrison Knudsen Washington Group, URS, currently known as AECOM. In January of 2005, Calvin relocated to South Carolina and started his own company called CCCS International LLC. He has incorporated some of, some of the same principles and techniques that he acquired while working for AECOM, leading to the company he has today. He has taken advantage of everything that Pam just talked about, and he has done well. He is going to share his story, how he got from being an employee to being his own boss. May I present to you Mr. Calvin Whitfield. Thank you all for coming out. Um, this is a little new to me. I can see this one. Really, um, I can tell you all how to take what Mr. Green said and how you can make money. I, I know that seemed kind of crazy, but um, the catch is you must really fill out one of those applications. She kind of gave it to you guys, South Carolina Department of Transportation. Thank God for Obama because when he came president, he, um, they put out a referendum where if you certify in your home state, which is, let's say, South Carolina, if you have your DOT, then the work come up um, in North Carolina, Georgia, Alaska, any other state, you can get certified in that state. So as Ms. Green said, that um, sometimes they have a general contractor or what have you that say, hey, you know, I like working with George and, you know, I have this work over in North Carolina and, um, you know, need some qualified, certified DBEs or MBEs or WBEs. Well, that certification works. The key is, is um, once you fill it out, you have that stack of information. You can fill out the one for Ms. Green. You can fill out the one that's called the 8A program, which is another, let's say, uh, Ms. Green mentioned, you know, they have an opportunity here with a billion dollars or more that they can spend with us. But just imagine the federal government. Everything the federal government buys, toilet paper, toothpaste, water, whatever they buy, has to go through that program. So when you hear the politicians say that the country is built on the backs of a small minority bit or small business. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about really, that is their, their search engine. If you get certified, um, let's say like here in South Carolina, you can just start that process. It is, it's, just, it's the same paperwork. All you're doing is once you have, let's say, your articles of incorporation, so you, you just make like six copies, in my opinion. You got one over here for the federal government for the AA, you got one over here for Ms. Green, you got one over here for the state of South Carolina, then you have one in your county, whatever county you live in, then you have one with the city. Those are five. So if you do things like that, it, it kind of help, it helps us out. Sometimes I think a lot of people um, get the information and like, that is too much information. I ain't got time for that. I ain't got any more. I ain't got any more. You'll be surprised, like, like she mentioned, um, 
being prepared. A lot of people here don't really know about the LLR. Uh, let's say, for instance, uh, they're the police, if you want to say. Uh, in the state of South Carolina, for you to take on a contract, for me to give you a contract, if you claim or say you are a, a general contractor or if you're performing contractor or construction type activity, you must have a license in the state. That license is different than a business license. That license is with the LLR, like accountants, doctors, lawyers, or what have you. In the state of South Carolina, if you get any work or contract over $5,000, you have to be licensed. So, once you mention the individual with the $5 million, that individual um, may not, he, he may have had his license and he, he may have had all these other boxes, but he may be missed out on, on, on the person part of it. So, with that being said, how do you get, a, I don't want to say get around it, but how do you take what you have and make it work for you until you get those other things? You have to team with somebody. You have to hook up with somebody, partner, think outside the box. Um, I'll, I'll start uh, with some of these. So, I'll give you guys a, a good example of thinking outside the box. You all remember when Boeing came to North Charleston. Basically, Charleston was dying. They really threw all of us a lifeline, contrary to the union or whatever, but they threw us a lifeline as, as contractors. Well, it was Turner Construction and um, B, B -E -K, uh, B -E -K, um was the two contractors. They had a nice little meeting there, and they was on their stage, and they said, do not pass us no uh, business cards. We don't want the capability things. We don't want anything. So, and one of those people looked exactly like a lot of us in this room. And so I'm saying to myself, how am I going to get there? So, I went out there. You see that? There's a bus right out there. The guy told me, he said, don't come to me asking for a job. Come to me figuring out, telling me how you can help. So what I started doing, this is thinking outside the box, I said, okay, on most construction sites, big ones, they don't allow us to park out there. You know, right? Because if you hit your truck, or you hit your car, you got to move your car, all that kind of stuff. So you got to have some type of off-site parking. Well, guess what? That I don't consider, you don't have to go to the LLR for that. So you just have to figure out a way, like say, hey, you know, here's a parking lot, I'll rent this parking lot, and I'll give me a school bus or something, and I'll start shelling people. I've done that for Boeing, not exaggerating, five years. Did you that? I have my unlimited general contract license. I'm not saying it's the both of this, making a point. I have my unlimited general contract license, I have my architecture license, I have my engineering license, and my construction management license. Stay on give account four licenses. We have all four of them. The key is, here I am, sitting there with all four of those licenses. But before Boeing came, what I was doing, I had these little, I uh, call them sowing seeds. So I'd take my little piece of paper, and I'd roll it up, and you know, you know leave it on the mailbox. You can pick that up, you know, you can touch that. That's the only part of the mailbox you can touch. So I walk through neighborhoods, and I put this leaflet on there. I'll do your roof, I'll do your driveway, I'll do whatever. I've done that for three years before going out of danger. But I still I have all those licenses. The key is you just can never stop, stop trying and working. I mean, you can't, you just, it's just, you gotta have it. You, 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 you all have it in you because you wouldn't be here today, you know, sitting here giving up your Saturday. So, with that being said, so what I ended up doing with this fellow um, for the Boeing, I go there, he tell me, he says, I'll come to my office on Monday. I go to, I go to that job site on Monday. Of course, the brother right there, right? So I said, okay. I asked people, I said, where is his office at? He said, his office right down there. Hand of God. I walked to his office. I hit my little business card that I made of myself, you know, my tiptoe. <laughs> Everywhere in his office, this is a true story. I said, he's going to touch the light fixture. I'll take the business card of the light fixture. I'll put it on his computer. I'll put it on his computer. I'll put it on his telephone. On his desk, everywhere in his office. The guy called me about three days later. He said, Now you got my attention, what you gonna do for me? <laughs> so I went and had a meeting with him, and I told him, I said, Listen, I said, because uh, you know, where Boeing is built at, it's right on the active airport, so you can't park there. So I said, I go to him, I said, Listen, man, I can give you off site parking. Well, when you do that, you gotta, have, uh, you gotta hire the police department, you know. So the police department, you hire them so they can. You know, 
crossing guard. So now you got this, the city of North Charleston, you know, the officers, they love you because you're giving them off duty work. So I had to go find these buses. So I ended up going by five buses and I started transporting people. Well, that contract turned in from transporting them to, because I had those certifications. Now, Boeing, when they came here, a lot of people don't know this, Boeing really didn't get a lot of tax incentives, or they, they didn't require the tax incentives to all of the lower tier subs because Boeing didn't get Title VI or federal dollars. So that's a big, you know, that's a big, big thing. That's her agency, Dr. Arlene Prince's agency, um, as far as South Carolina Department of Traffic. When you have federal dollars involved, that's when they need us. That's why you have to be prepared. But Boeing came, they, they didn't need us, but that was kind of like the only game in town for quite a while. But anyway, so th that's, that's one way how you can uh, work, work the system. You have to be able to uh, think, like I said, out, outside the box, but uh, we're open up for questions and, and, and try my best to answer. Are some of the buildings uh, Going through. What we built? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Like this right here. This is a um, two schools, Dorchester District 2. Um, that's on one campus. That's this used to be um, Akiem Way. It's a middle school and elementary school. I give you a great example. I was that fella that she talked about. Not, not the five million dollar fella. But, <laughs> but I, was really, I was really that fella. I, honest, honest, true story. That that school, tell you how it happened. I uh, came. To South Carolina, I used to work for a company called AECOM, which is one of the largest construction companies. So years ago, um, old man Bush had a policy with the START Treaty with Russia. We were decommissioning nuclear weapons. I wasn't in the military or anything. I just was doing construction. So they sent me over there to work on the, in Russia. So I worked in Russia for three years. If you guys remember, when we started, the, when the war started, it started because it was a Ukrainian shoulder rocket launcher that shot down an American aircraft. And that was the first time American aircraft was shot down since Pearl Harbor. So I come back. I was, I was over the construction. The guy told me, he said, Calvin, you got to go to Iraq. I said, I don't know what that was. I don't know. <laughs> so if you guys remember, when they first started the war, a lot of Americans were dying. Main reason is because if you look at these tables, say this would be you have to set up a work camp, then you have to have an area where you eat at, then you have an area where you work at. Well, that's the perimeter fence. So that fence was in the wrong part of, of this situation because they can launch stuff over and blow up when you sleep in it. I didn't, I didn't want to go. So to make a long story short, they gave me an ultimatum. They said, okay, Calvin, you got 90 days. Either you go over there, do your own thing, or you know, find another job. So that forced me to quit because I was scared to jump off that ledge too. You know, 22 years I worked for that company. But so back in that school, I was coming through. I love riding motorcycle, gravel motorcycle, going down to Florida, south of South Carolina. That's what Skibo used to be in a periodical. It used to be a magazine. They used to sell it at Barnes and Noble for that. So I, I was in there reading it one day. I see that school and I say, ah, I built some schools in Detroit. I'm like, I can do this. I said, I'm charging $150 a square foot. It was 225,000 square feet, right? So I get a phone call. I'm sitting there in Detroit, went to my dad at the time. They called me funny, they said, Congratulations, you got the job. I was like, what job? They said, you got to build a school. They said, we need your contract license, which I didn't have. In Michigan, you don't have to have a contract license. So I didn't have it. And you would need your bond. I have a bond in the program either. So working for that company for 22 years, it was, a, it was a Oklahoma, in Oklahoma, uh, General Motors, where you would build Silverado trucks and all that. They had a, 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 tor a tornado that tore one of the facilities. They called me. I was working for that company to go there to fix that facility. Well, I ended up meeting a company there called Oscar J. Boat, really big in Oklahoma. So the guy said, man, if there's anything we can do, we can do. I can help you, whatever. Ah, perfect opportunity. <laughs> so, what I done is I called him. I said, "Man, I said I got a job." He said, "Really? What kind?" I said, "Twenty-five million dollars." He said, "Wow, well, Calvin, how you get that?" I said, "I did it." Hey, with the guy though, he was a smart fella too. He said, "You bid it, you run it, but I get my money first. Whatever left, you get." It. Oh, okay. 
But I said, okay, I'll do it. $25 million. It ended up being $26.3, something like that. You know how much money I got out of that thing? $250,000. When it was all said and done. I said to myself, never happen again. <laughs> so that's what made me um, really get my license and, and all, that, all that other stuff. But, but that was one of those pictures. Um, a couple of these, these other ones, we, we, what I ended up doing is, a lot of them, I am the GC, but then a lot of them, I, I like, um, I'll, I'll be a sub to someone. Because, um, unfortunately, until you really, really have um, everything in place, as far as, um, let's say, um, like, say, that bridge, that, like, say, that bridge there, when you're doing bridge work, for instance, they have to use Ms. Green's office. They got to use South Carolina Department of Transportation. They have to use us. So normally, we don't. This is thinking outside the box. So when you look at that, when you go on the freeway, you look at all that work going up and down the freeway. A couple of things that we could do that a lot of us miss out on. We can provide the water. You like a water truck? You know, you can rent your water truck. You got a credit card. You can rent that. They got. They already got the hydrant permit. They got everything up, so you can rent them your water truck. The other thing they don't have a lot of times is um, they don't have like safety equipment. Like you know, think about it, the vests wear out, those um, barrels wear out. You know what I'm saying? A lot of things like that you can buy and just flip real quick. You know, so you you get it 30 days. Even if you don't have credit, you can tell you go to that vendor and you can say, hey, here I have this contract or I have this purchase order, and you know to buy a thousand barrels and, and then make that. The vendor will say, okay, you haven't been in business that long, so I'll, I'll do a joint pay agreement, which means that that vendor is going to get his money from that contractor. Again, you ain't got to come out your pocket, because when the contractor gets paid, he going to pay the vendor. So you can still work. So you got a thousand barrels this week, you go down the street, get another thousand. There's, there's, there's a lot of ways to, to really uh, make money cleaning, you know, cleaning services. Some people think they 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 too good for that. You got cleaning service. A lot of us we we you know a lot of companies when you get to the um, the highway and things of that nature. The first thing they go to her office and say, oh we need 15, uh, 1,500 truckers. But well, ain't nobody got fifteen hundred trucks. So they, they 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 do that. So they they kind of give they kind of position us or come when it's our turn. When it's federal dollars, I consider that our turn. When it's our turn, we need to learn how to say, okay, I only got four trucks, but he got three, he got six, he got five, so I take these 20 trucks or what have you, and what we're going to do is we're going to work twice. We're going to do 10 hours, we're going to get some other people, they're going to do 10 hours. So now you gave the man 40 trucks to the 20 trucks. You know, and then you do the same exact thing with the fuel. If anybody here got trucks, they understand what I'm saying. You do the same thing with the fuel, the fuel, fuel. So you, you go back to the wherever you're buying your fuel from, the gas station, whoever. Hey, look, every two weeks, I pay you. You got to make that deal in your, in your uh, purchase order. But things like that, really, uh, I give you another one about, about their, their program. It's, uh, you'll see Myrtle Beach Airport up here. We, uh, we ended up getting. Myrtle Beach Airport, when you go there, see how those things that look like it's wings from a plane. We designed that and, and we built them. There's a company called Darden Construction and HG Reynolds. Okay? Those two fellas, it was those two guys, and it was another company called FBI Florence Builder Inc. So we weren't low. I went to them. They had one of these kind of meet and greet things. So I go and I was like, hey, we do drywall. We take my number. No, we got it. No, we got it. That job required 10.75% because it was federally regulated. So the um, Dargan didn't have, they didn't meet the goal. HG Reynolds didn't meet the goal. FBI met the goal because of me. The FBI was $2 million higher than Dargan. They gave the contract to FBI. Here's where Dr. Arlene Prince, I love the lady. I love her, love her, love her. Great person, like like Pam, 
that lady, they challenged her program. They went all the way to the court. I won't give you the exact word, but the uh, guy for Darnit, he stood up in, in court. He says, can't no end person run a company like that. He is not black. He's someone else. They, the LOR, remember I told you they police. police. They investigated me three times. First time they investigated me for my ethnicity. Second time they investigated me because they thought someone else took the contract or license. Because I didn't have, remember I told you I had a license, contract over $5,000. So they investigated me for the license. When you go take that test for the license, you sit in front of the computer, you snap your picture. When you sit down and take it, when you finish it, they tell you pass or fail. So when you hear people say I got 90% on it, they lie to you. But you say you pass or fail. And then they take your picture when you pass, right? So now the LLR, here's the funny thing. Kind of like in the service, you're guilty to prove it that you got free self innocent. So they didn't have that picture of me taking the test. But they I still had to go through the scrutiny of Darwin. The last last one, three times, that was two. The last one was they challenged my website because, um, again, you got to get your license from the LLR. We have our architectural license. On our website, we say we can help developers, owners with construction services such as, keywords, such as architectural design, da 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 da. They said, well, he don't have his architectural license. They weren't prepared. They didn't do their research. So that those those agencies really, really can, can be um, a great deal of help. At the end of that story, Dr. Arlene Prince, uh, South Carolina Department of Transportation, they wrote a letter. Uh, she stood up and um, basically defended us. I never even met the lady. And the key is she she done that without you know it wasn't no she black I'm black you know. We barbecue when we doing something. You know, like, you know, right? But um, so I, I only say that to say those those agencies are. It's really it's worth it. And the last thing, uh, like we we all try, we all are true to ourselves. You know what I'm saying? We look at ourselves. You know, we can tell ourselves in the mirror. You know, the, the real truth. In all honesty, um, you have to kind of do that with those agencies because. I'm quite sure that I'm just going to use the five million dollar guy. If, if he would have shared that with her, she could have. She probably had someone else in her agency that that had her list. She could say, "Well, you could hook up with this person, or you could meet this person." You know, um, in the last, you know, we have to get over there. I don't want to do business with you. Yeah. you know, I, yeah. But but we. we, we so we, 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 we would do it. We would do it with others. I mean, it ain't a black white thing, but but we do we do it with, we do it with other people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, if if I if I say I give you a five million dollar contract right now, you never done business with it. But you, you know what I'm saying? But since she said, well, he, he have his own business, and you know, okay, it's a little bit. But let's say if, if you 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 people here on this front row. Let's say like y'all get together and try to try to do you know do something. We we kind of we miss that. I mean, how many times they come into your your areas and they, we call the dog and pony show. Oh here they go. They want us to come out here. You know, parade us out here. Hey, we are all here. You know, we're my daughter. Give us a job. Give us a job. But you know, we don't. We have to work. I mean, that's. I don't. I, I don't want to say this. You got to say that's because you got your own job. Well, you got your own company. It's not really hard if you just fill out one of those applications. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Just one of them, you just make one for copy. That, that's one way. The second way is, you know, you can, you can drive one of the jobs. Like, you know, no one can sell your product or your service better than you. That's right. But you, but what you have to just, the only thing you have to remember is, well, well, we can assist you with that. You know, instead of using the word contract, we can use the word purchase order. Remember what I said. Hey, I have a contract that's five thousand dollars. So there's a lot of ways that you can read the LLR and kind of say, hmm, contract purchase order. So you ask for a purchase order. You know what I'm saying? You can you can uh, there's ways like that. So any 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 questions? We we we're doing projects down down here in your neck of the woods. We um, 
we currently are working at, at um, Paris Island. We're working at um, the uh, air station. And um, you all have a, an individual that's close down here. Uh, any of you know Gerald Neal, Neal Construction? Yeah. Great, 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 great individual. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 um, I tell you tell you one thing he's done for me. Uh, he, he's a true believer in helping out. I got in the 8A program. Um, Juro, he just graduated from the 8A program. That program, you get in there, you're in there for nine years. Basically, something. So all of you be real interested. The government gave you an opportunity to make a hundred million dollars. You got nine years to do it. So, to me, that that's all I need. You know, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but Juro Neal. He, he, he was in that, he, he just graduated that program. I, I'm in the program now, I'm in my third year. But here's the key about that program. It goes back, anything our government, anything, dropping off medicine, you know, picking up vets, picking up, picking up other people, uh, doing laundry service, doing, you know, washing, going, taking the laundry. It's just, you know, all of us have a vehicle. I mean, you, there's so many ways that, that, that we can do it. Jerry O'Neill, when I first got in the program, I didn't really know how it worked. Not trying to be smart. I'm, I'm kind of a street hustler. You know, I'm, I love the streets. But <laughs> you have, you have the government. When you work for the government or on those bases, you got fence around. So the going joke is, you used to work an outside the fence, Calvin. We work inside the fence. So when you work inside the fence, a lot of rules and regulations. You know, you can't. You can't take a contract off and say, hey, come on, let's go to lunch, you know what I'm saying? Tell me what you want to you know, see if I can make it happen. You know, you can't do that. So, Gerald really schooled me to the, the do's and don'ts. Um, and also, he ended up, uh, he helped me with, with, with my paperwork because there, there is paperwork, but think about it. You have someone that's in that program, at that time, Gerald was in his seventh year. So, he, he's seven years in. The good thing that he's done is they have these things called AHA, you know, um, or JSA job, um, safety analysis and everything. So, but you have to create one of those. Gerald, uh, great brother, he says, Cal, here the this for all of them. So I have to go back and create the wheel. So, you know, wonderful, wonderful in individual, but we just have to figure out how we can help, help one another. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, but any questions? A true example of how state agencies can help you get to where you need to be. Trust the process. If you trust the process, you will benefit from the process. Ms. Annie Hill, she's program manager at the South Carolina Department of Employment and Workforce. Amy has 12 years of experience in the workforce field. She is currently a statewide manager of both the Work Opportunity Tax Credit and the Federal Bonding Programs for the South Carolina Department of Employment and Workforce. In addition to overseeing the metrics and standards, Hill is responsible for outreach and education to ensure employers understand how to fully utilize these incentives when hiring individuals with barriers to employment and to help job seekers leverage these programs during their job search. Ms. Hill holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology from Lyme Stone College, and she has a background expertise in human resources. She is going to give you some information that you do not know existed in the state of South Carolina. May I introduce Ms. Amy Hill. So I'm going to ask a quick question. It's going to sound kind of dumb, but who in here loves to pay general tax liability? <laughs> Nobody? No. That's, okay. Well, who would want to lower it and maybe get rid of it? Yeah, hands go up when I ask that. So um, when you're hiring new staff, who would want to mitigate risk? I mean, that's, we're in business to what? Make money, right? So what you want to do is when you're hiring new people, you, you, you really don't know 
who they are, and they're coming to you. You, know, you can check references. But in the event that you see something that you want to give them an opportunity and you're not quite sure about it, you can actually mitigate risk through volume. So I'm going to go through these programs. The first one I want to tell you about is a tax incentive. It's a federal tax incentive. It is a U.S. Department of Labor program administered out of the South Carolina Department of Employment and Workforce. A little bit about it. So again, it is a federal incentive. It was, rene it was renewed in 2015 by Congress through the PATH Act. And the reason it's important to know that is I'm going to give you a date. Um, and then tell you what to do or watch for. So this program was renewed for five years, the last time during the PATH Act. It does expire this December 31st of 2019, but you want to continue, and I'll go through the process of applying for the certification for this tax credit, but you want to continue to apply for it even if the program goes into hiatus, um, because we do expect fully that it will renew with Congress, and there is a time frame where you need to apply for a certification to get this tax credit. So just a little bit more, WOTC can be combined with the state tax credits. Um, it can be combined with federal bonding, and I'll explain more about that program in just a moment. Um, and it can be combined with on-the-job training and apprenticeship programs as well. And one thing that you want to remember with that is if someone's coming to you through an OJT or an apprenticeship and part of their salary is being paid by that, it's a federal uh, subsidy, you want to make sure that the, the, the wage cap begins or you start calculating after they go on your actual payroll. So the purpose of WOTC, which is the Work Opportunity Tax Credit, is for job seekers to leverage their eligibility with an employer, letting them know that they may qualify you as an employer for a tax credit. Um, and for the WOTC tax friendly employer, you, you may be able to reduce your general tax liability and get rid of it even if you hire individuals that qualify. Um, we want it to lead job seekers that have barriers to self-sufficiency. And the only way to be self-sufficient is when you're employed, right? So who qualifies? There, uh, there are some different targeted barriers, individuals with barriers. And on the table, you should have gotten two brochures from me and also a business partner letter. Now, in this brochure, it's going to tell you a little bit more about the groups, the targeted groups of individuals that face barriers when they're looking for employment. And it'll tell you the max tax credit. The average, average tax credit for a new hire, if they qualify your business, is $2,400. But there are some that have heavier, heavier tax credits with it. Um, there are, and, and I won't go through the qualifiers of these targeted groups, but just give you a couple examples. Like if you hire an individual that's an ex-felon and they've been released within a year or convicted within a year, um, and you want to give them an opportunity because they have great skills, and you've got other people that don't really have those skills. So you can possibly get a tax credit if you give that person the opportunity of employment. You can also have them federally bonded, but I'll go over that in just a second. So there's two DSS programs, individuals that may have uh, received TANF, it's the Temporary Assistant to Needy Families, it used to be known as Welfare. Um, the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, just for instance, had to qualify for that with somebody between 18 and 39 and they would have received SNAP uh, for six months up to the hire date. Um, and, and let me just say, out of all of these targeted groups, when someone walks into your business, you're not going to be able to look at them and go, oh, that person uh, is a vocational rehabilitation client. Um, I'll give them the screening form. You should be screening every single person that applies with your business. Because you can't look at an individual and tell they've received SNAP. You can't look at an individual and, and, and tell uh, that they receive vocational rehabilitation services. So there are a lot of targeted groups in here, and you can go over them and look through there. But just think about it. You know, if, if you can put the forms in your hire process, in your application process, in your onboarding process, they really fill out most of this. You just put your company information on it. 
but you, you've got to screen every single one of your hires because you just can't tell. So um, we have also some veteran targeted groups. So a WOTC veteran would be somebody that served active duty for 180 days or they were uh, discharged due to a, a, a service disability. Um, dishonorable discharge veterans are not excluded from either of these programs that I'm telling you about, which is good because most of the time they don't, they don't get services if they're dishonorable discharges. If, you hire, if you're a 501c and you hire a qualified veteran, you can also receive a tax credit. It's just a little bit different because they don't have general tax liability. They would have to take it off the Social Security portion of their taxes when they get that. And a little bit more about the veteran target groups. Somebody, a veteran that receives SNAP, um, disabled veteran target group. Uh, and again, the qualifiers are in the brochure. Uh, a disabled veteran that was unemployed six months or more, or a veteran that was unemployed four weeks, less than six months, or six months or more. And probably the, the, the weightiest value would be the disabled veteran six months unemployed or longer. Now, who's not eligible? So a rehire would not be eligible. So if somebody comes back to you and they want a, a job with you, might as well not even screen them. This is to, the purpose of this is to get new hires employees, somebody that's faced barriers, that's having a difficult time to find a job, um, and it helps them become self-sufficient. So rehires not, not eligible, relatives, non-relatives, uh, you do need to be deducting federal taxes out of their wages. So 1099 contractors or someone that's uh, invoicing you, you couldn't do that with. Um, the biggest thing to remember is when a new hire comes into your business, you want to send the certification request in, and it's two forms, and I'll tell you about, more about that in a second, within 28 days of their start date, not their hire date. And I'm going to say that a couple of times through here because that's very important. Um, so, how to get the required forms. There's two forms. There is an IRS 8850 pre-screen form. I highly recommend you put that in your application process, in your packets that you give somebody. That they come through the door, you give them the application. Give them the 8852. If they ask what it's for, just let them know it's a, it's a screening uh, paper that if you decide to give them an, an opportunity of employment, you may receive a tax credit. Usually that satisfies the questions. Um, you can email our office, and that's the WOTC, and it is um, on the brochure, WOTC at do.se.gov, and we can actually give you the forms. There is a 9061 form, which is a DOL form. Now, instead of sending you to two different websites, you can go to the DO website, and you can get them both there, because when Congress renews the program, sometimes they change the targeted groups, and they add one, or they revamp one or take one away that didn't perform well. Um, but we have both of those forms on our website so you don't have to go to IRS and DOL and look for them. Uh -oh. Okay. So the submission requirements. The first thing that you have to do is you have to get a certification from our office to be able to calculate and take the tax credit. So you'll get the, again, the 8850. They really fill it out. It's two pages, and I have, I have the form in the slides. I'll show you in just a second. Um, and the 9061, excuse me, the 9061 form, you can uh, put that into the onboarding paperwork. So you would want to put that in with the I-9 and the W-4 whenever you're doing the onboarding. And it just gives us more details as to what target group they are identifying with, so we'll know which, which way to look and try to qualify them. Again, the 28-day deadline from the start date. Don't forget that because we have no way of, of, of forgiving that or changing that. Um, if there's supporting documentation that is needed, don't hold up those papers. Don't hold up that, the certification application. Um, we can get that from you later. Also, just so you know, and this is the good part about it, is there's no limit on the credits taken. So if you hire one person that qualifies for $2,400 tax credit, and this is all based on their first year of employment, so we have one two-year target group, and I'll tell you about that in a second. But then you hire three more, 
eventually you hire 10 more, let's say that they all qualified you for $2,400, that's a $24,000 tax credit that you can lower your general tax liability. If you don't know that much at the end of the year, you can carry those over. And I highly recommend that you get with your CPA because I believe uh, that there's a couple of years that you can actually carry those certifications into the future, into the future to lower your tax, general tax liability. Um, this is what the 8850 looks like. If you look at the top, the, the, the new hire, potential new hire, or the job seeker, would fill this out, they'd put their information on it and check one of the boxes, and that's just saying that they identify with one of the groups, the targeted groups, and they sign and date it. On the back of that form, the company puts their information. Now these can be pre-filled and printed out with your all's information, so you're only filling it out one time. Um, and then you sign and date it. There's a couple of dates in there that you put just uh, information as far as when they gave you the information, when you offered the job, uh, when they were hired and started. So that's in the application paperwork, one form. Not, not a whole lot there. And again, if you pre-fill that back part, you're only signing and dating it and putting some dates on it. The second form is the DOL form. The top portion is the company information. But if you look at box eight, it says, have you ever worked here before, or has this person ever worked there before? If you check yes, you might as well not submit it. Because even if we don't, if we don't indicate through our wage records or how our process works that they've worked there before, and you know they have, I guarantee the IRS knows that they have. So don't send it in, because I don't want you to take a tax credit for somebody that really wouldn't qualify. Um, and again, our process only goes back so far, so we're, we're not responsible for detecting whether that person had worked for you before or not, so just be really careful about that. So the rest of it, they just check some yes or no's, the new hire, and then they sign and date it. You can also fill out this form for them if you need to and sign and date it. You just need to identify who's actually filling out the form. So those are the two forms. And you can submit them either via um, e-file, because we have a WOTC portal. That means you get an account, uh, you can join me for a webinar, I'll send you an email once you uh, log in and get that account established. Uh, we'll go over a lot of, of what we're going over today, and you can ask questions. Um, you can e-file it that way. Keep the forms, there is a four-year retention if you get a certification. Uh, you can mail it also. If you want to mail them, that's fine. We'll take them and set the account up for you. And that's where you, uh, we can either mail you the determination, if, whether it's certified or not, or you can go online and print that yourself if you have an e-file account. So after the submission, what would you expect from our office? We're going to take that, we're going to review that information, we're going to send you a determination, or either you'll get it through the electronic uh, account. It's either going to be certified or denied. If you get a denial, make sure you read it, because we may be asking you for documentation that we can't get. Most of our, most of our targeted groups, we have auto interfaces with other agencies, and we can pretty much do the determination without documentation. Um, but it, again, if you get a denial, read it and see if we're asking for additional documentation. If we are, you have a year from the original denial date to send that to us in the form of an appeal. And then we can give you a final determination. So taking a credit. This is where I tell everybody, I can give you just a little bit of information, but I'm not a licensed CPA and I don't, don't want to pretend to be one. Um, but there is some calculation. I highly recommend that you work with your tax preparer, your licensed CPA. Um, they'll probably uh, ask you to do the, the calculation of the credit if you get the certification. It's going to be based on how many hours that person worked for you. There's, there's a, a two tiers. There's 120 hours, less than 400. You can take 25% up to their first year's wages up to a maximum wage cap. And the, and the maximum wage caps are, are different for some of the targeted groups. Um, you want to make sure if, if they worked less than 120 hours, don't send it in. Because again, we're not going to be able to tell that. So we may send you a certification and they only work 80 hours and you really can't take the tax credit. For-profit entities, 
they would use the IRS form 5884 and 3800 to claim the tax credit once they've calculated it at the end of the year. Um, Not-for-profit entities, uh, again, only hiring the veteran target groups, uh, they would use the 5884C and it would come off their taxes a little different, the Social Security portion. So this is what the calculation chart looks like and, and it is on our new website and with the forms. Um, but it tells you a little bit about each of the targeted groups, what the two tiers are, how you would calculate it, what the maximum wage cap is for each one. Um, and again, it's 25% for 120 hours, but less, less than 400. And then it goes to 40% of their first year's wages up to the wage cap after 400 hours. Um, the bottom part is the veteran target groups. And this is the for-profit chart. If you're a not-for-profit chart, you can email me I can definitely get that for you. Um, but the disabled unemployed veteran, uh, you can get a tax credit up to $9,600. So that's, um, again, the, the, this is just a summary of what I just told you. 40% first year wages, 400 plus more hours, 25% uh, for 120 to 400 hours. Uh, 120 hours, don't send it in because I might send you a certification and I don't want you to try and take a tax credit. And the only target group that we do have that is a two-year tax credit is the long-term TANF. So that would be someone that had received um, what was formerly known as welfare that's now known as temporary assistance to needy family for a long period of time. There's a couple of different qualifiers for that, but that is a two-year tax credit. So we can stop now and do questions about WOTC or go on to federal bonding and then just do questions afterwards. I'll leave that up to y'all. Does anybody have any questions about WOTC? How many people have heard of it? Yeah, just three. Okay, I'm so glad that I was invited. Thank y'all for having me because you really need to screen every single person. You need to make that part of your application process, part of your orientation onboarding process because you are literally possibly, I won't say possibly because it's not always a guarantee to get it, but you could be walking away from getting rid of your general tax liability. You know what that does for the state of South Carolina? It keeps the money here. So from June, well, was July 1st, of last year to June 30th of this year, we certified a, over $105 million in the state. So there, there's businesses out there that can take these tax credits and lower or annihilate their general tax liability, and I want you guys to be able to do the same thing. And this is an old brochure, and we just got brand new ones, so that's what you have. But the information is definitely um, on the back of the brochure, uh, wotc at do.se.gov. If you have any questions, email us, because that goes to our staff email. And if I'm out, there's other people there that can answer your question. Um, and if you want me to call you, I'm Amy. And on the back of this business letter is my direct line and email. Please call me. I will be glad to help you guys get this set up and give you some advice. But this letter is really good. It gives you the WOTC information and how to start the process, where to go online to get that online account. The link is on the letter. And then on the back is what we're fixing to talk about, federal bonding. Um, and Information is also on the letter about federal bonding and how it can help you mitigate risk when you're hiring new individuals. So federal bonding is also a U.S. Department of Labor program, and it's administered out of the South Carolina Department of Employment and Workforce in our area. And the purpose is to assist high-risk job seekers um, obtain employment through offering fidelity insurance through employers or potential employers. So right now, with our, uh, our unemployment rate being so low, it's really, really, really hard to get the kind of talent that you're looking for. Um, and this can help you open up your hiring policies and practices to uh, maybe give somebody an opportunity that you wouldn't look at before. Um, just because they've uh, served time or have a, a record of arrest doesn't mean that they won't do a good job for you. 
most folks do a really good job if you give them a chance. That's what they're looking for. And this program has been uh, active since, well, it's been 50 years. So for the last 50 years, the individuals that have been bonded through this to get a second chance, they have actually had less, out of 50 years, less than 1% claim rate. That's because people want a second chance and they want to be able to get a job and become independent and self-sufficient. So a little bit about what Fidelity Bond Coverage is. It is an insurance policy that protects employers against acts of dishonesty committed by a covered, a covered employee. Um, and it protects them from the loss of money or property due to that act of dishonesty. So a little bit more about who it could cover. This year, South Carolina received a grant, first time ever, first time it was ever offered by DOL through our WIOA program. Um, we received a grant to, to offer these bonds to businesses uh, for hiring individuals with judiciary involvement. It could be a record of arrest, it could be conviction, it could be uh, a felony conviction, a misdemeanor conviction. It's up to you, the employer, whether you want to give them a, a chance or not, but just know that this is out there and these funds are out there so that we can help you mitigate risk and help you get that talent that you're looking for, regardless of what the unemployment rate is doing, and, and offer somebody a second chance. Um, we can also bond individuals that are recovering addicts somebody that has poor personal credit or lack of work history. If you have somebody that comes to you and they absolutely uh, don't have any work references for you, like be a, a brand new graduate, they've never had a job before, you don't quite know them, can't get any references, but you want to give them a chance, we can bond them as well. Um, dishonorable discharge, not excluded. Sometimes that equates to a negative job reference, but they're not excluded. So there is something about second chances for the judiciary involved individuals. Um, the program will cover things like embezzlement, theft, larceny, forge, uh, forge, forgeries that cause you to lose money. Um, what it won't cover is poor workmanship. So if they break it, don't file a claim. It won't cover any of their salary and it won't cover uh, job injuries because we all know that's workers' comp anyway. It won't cover any bail, court, contract, or licensing fees. So what's the benefits for you guys? Um, $5,000 coverage is, is the minimum coverage. If you have equipment on your site that can walk away that is more valuable than $5,000, call me and let's walk through that and talk about it. Because I can go up to $25,000 and $5,000 increments, and I'd be happy to do that to protect your business. Um, there's no paperwork for you. I'm going to do all of that for you, and I'll submit it to the insurance company. You're going to get six months of this coverage at no cost. So there's, there's, you don't have to pay anything. You just have to make sure you're registered in SE Works, um, and that the person coming to you is registered in SE Works. And SE Works can provide you with a myriad of other services. There are lots of services, and they actually have a table over there in the gym. Um, so when you finish and you go over there for lunch, I encourage you to stop by and see them and talk to them as well. Um, they can provide you services at no cost, um, other additional services. So you're going to get six months of coverage, no cost, and the bond will automatically terminate. So what do you do in the six months if you want to continue the coverage you're not quite sure? Don't lay them off if you're not sure. You can contact the insurance company and talk to them and get a quote, a market rate quote, about covering them an additional six months. If it ends up you don't want to do that and you're just, you know, things get tight sometimes, call me before you let them go. I'm, I, I want to mitigate or, or try to not have this person laid off. We can look at doing it another six months just to avoid them being laid off. So, so the benefits for any job seeker, if you have anybody out there that's family, that's having a hard time getting a job, let them know. Let them know that they can use this program as leverage if they're having barriers to employment. Um, it can give folks a second chance, and even a first chance, and it's not going to cost them either. So nobody's going to pay for it the first six months. 
we're going to pay for that, we're going to cover it. It does reduce recidivism for those individuals that have judiciary involvement of you know, somebody that's been convicted, um, maybe served time. So eligibility, again, both the company and the individual job seeker has to be registered in SE Works. They do need to be a newly hired individual. There's two cases that they can be a current employee, I'll go over that in just a second. It's a little different than WOTC. WOTC is a new hire, period. Never were there before. This is a little different. It can be a newly hired person. So you definitely want to make sure that you are deducting federal taxes from your wages as well. So it wouldn't work with a 1099 or a contract or somebody invoicing you that's doing work for you. So for individuals that are currently working for you, we can bond them in an effort to uh, avert them being laid off or to secure a promotion. Um, an example of that is if uh, somebody is applying for a promotion, they're going to have some managerial responsibility, maybe even a company credit card, but they don't have good credit. Instead of passing them over just because you know they ran into a couple of uh, issues in their life and their credit wasn't as stellar as they need to be for them to carry a card, call me and let me bond them for you and let, offer them and give them a chance at that promotion. So ineligible would be current employees except for those two exceptions. They do need to meet the legal age requirement in South Carolina to work and they can't be the self-employed or independent contractors. So steps for the job seeker, again if you have family out there looking for a job, send them to SE Works or have them register online. They would need to go buy SE Works if they wanted some information to provide to an employer so they can obtain a voucher. And what that voucher does is it lets the employer know that they are eligible and that they can contact me. My information will be on that voucher to get the bond. So they usually distribute it with their voucher and their resumes when they fill out applications or when they feel that that time is right. I usually tell job seekers when I'm talking to them, don't go running through the door with that voucher. You're going to scare somebody. <laughs> so use your judgment and find, you know, when a barrier is thrown up, you may want to go ahead and let them know you're eligible. So this is what the voucher looks like, and they can get that again at SC Works and it'll have their name on it, and it'll have a local representative um, that'll sign the form. And again, my information is in the middle. It kind of tells them a little bit about what federal bonding is and how to get it. Um, and the good thing to remember about SC Works is they're there to serve the businesses and the job seekers at no charge, and they can offer uh, training and education uh, services, uh, create, help, help them do a resume, but there's also business services with SE Works that is there for you. So I encourage you to make an appointment with the SE Works folks to come out and talk to you about what they can do for you. So the steps for the employer, once you find someone that you want to hire, um, offer them a, a, the job, set a start date, the very first day that they get there and show up, call me and let me bond them for you. And get that risk mitigation going. Um, you can email us. And again, sometimes I'm in or out, and this goes to everybody in the office, the federal bonding email at do.se.gov. But again, you can also email me or call me on the back of that letter. That's my information. I'm going to get a little bit of information about you, make sure both is registered, the company and the job seeker, and then I'm going to submit that paperwork for you. And within a 15-day turnaround time, the insurance company out of Chicago will send you a bond packet to let you know that they're covered and, and you can just hold on to that and nothing happens, you forget about it. If something happens, you call the insurance company and file a claim. There is no deductible, that's another good thing. So we do have more information on our new website and again, you can email us and we can give you more information or if you wanna call and ask questions, we're there, that's what we're there for. Um, you also got a federal bonding brochure from me and it has um, our email on the back as well. And that is it. Uh, let's do questions. Does anybody have any questions?
absolutely. Yes, definitely. And, and you can take this tax credit, just remember any federal subsidized or any subsidized wages, you want to start the calculation of that maximum tax credit after that ends. But definitely. It's a good resource back there. I encourage everybody to talk to them. Any more questions? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so when you get these certifications and you calculate the tax credit, you actually are able to lower that general tax liability, which will, you, you get to keep that money in your pocket. You get to keep that money in South Carolina economy. And who doesn't want to keep that money? That's why I asked the question earlier, is like, who loves paying general tax liability? It was here. The whole hands went up. Yes, exactly. So I would encourage you to talk with your CPA too because there are other tax credits out there. Just, just for instance, with WOTC and the DSS targeted groups. DSS also offers state tax credits for some of their participating folks. You can't tell what somebody looks like when they come in there to apply at your business that they've received SNAP retainment. So if you want to make your business healthier, keep that money in your pocket. You may want to keep it in your pocket and invest it back in your business or, or take it home. It's up to you. When, you. when you save that money, you keep that money here and it affects your bottom line. It, 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 it helps you increase profit if, if you're able to lower that. <laughs> Any more questions? I think Yes. Yes, I would highly, highly recommend. As a matter of fact, I was just down um, in Charleston for their first ever conference for the Restaurant and Lodging Association that they did for their marketing and operator or management operations conference. Yes, I went down there and spoke to some of them and uh, I, every single restaurant, a hotel, any type of tourism industry, they should definitely be doing this and, and receiving these tax credits. And again, you can't take the credit unless you get certification from our office. So read that letter and if you have any questions, call me and I'll walk you through setting up the process. It is simple, simple, simple to set it up. But also, don't forget about mitigating risk by having those individuals bonded and expanding your talent pool selection by giving second chances. That's a, a huge uh, thing to get folks employed and vitally employed so that they can be self-sufficient, especially if they've had judiciary involvement. Is that it? Great. Thank you.